Hi, welcome to module six in our self-coaching series on stress management for healthcare providers, emergency responders, and our family members. Module six covers sleep issues. We've spoken about in the other modules how essential quality sleep and regular sleep is for our overall well-being physically, mentally, and emotionally. Easy enough said, harder to do, right? That's what this session is all about. So lots of times I hear responders in particular say, I don't have sleep problems. I'm out as soon as my head hits the pillow. That's not really a good thing if it's every <laughs> night. It's, um, there's this thing called sleep latency, the time from when you lie down to when you actually fall asleep. There should be several minutes in that window there. Falling asleep right away is a good sign that you are chronically stressed and or just exhausted. Yeah, um, and, and I think sometimes we put in there too that when we do struggle, with sleep, sometimes we end up doing things to try to facilitate our sleep. And I hear from a lot of responders in the clinical setting, you know what, I drink a little and I mostly drink at night so that it can help me get some good sleep. And what do you want from me, doc? You want me to sleep or, or, or drink or not drink and not sleep? What do you want here? There's, there's really only two options. And we really have to be careful because I think that when your head hits the pillow and you're just out, it's almost that passing out too. If you end up drinking, to go to sleep, what you're really doing is you're never gonna get good sleep, but you're sedating your frontal lobe. It's like um, going to the dentist to, mm -hmm. and being placed under some sedation quick while they remove a couple of teeth, but you're not gonna get any quality out of that. And you might fall asleep right away, but your quality is not gonna be there because you're over exhausted. And so again, to your point, just because your head hits the pillow, no matter how you got there, just chronic exhaustion or exhaustion with a few drinks, um, know that that's not, that, that's usually a bad sign. Mm -hmm. So, and often the other thing that we hear from responders is, oh, I fall asleep. Okay. That's not a problem, but I wake up in the middle of the night. Yeah. 2 a.m. 3 a.m. Exactly. Exactly. <clears throat> and we've taught, we've touched on this a little bit in some of the other modules, but generally speaking, if we wake up in the middle of the night, there's a couple different things going on. One is either we have processed all the alcohol that we drank in the evening and now <laughs> our blood sugar is plummeting, which sends a stress signal to our body saying that we're in danger. Body doesn't know why it just knows that dropping blood sugar is bad and, and it triggers up. the nervous system response and brings us back up to a state of wakefulness, especially not good if you're already chronically stressed. But otherwise, in the absence of alcohol or other sedating mechanisms, mm -hmm. we tend to wake up for three reasons. One is we've got that never ending to do list running in our head. Mm -hmm. And at three in the morning, and I've, I've heard a great description of this, and I love it, that you know, as, we, as we're chronically stressed, we maintain a pretty high level of cortisol in our bodies. During the day, we build up a substance called adenosine. Adenosine is one of the molecules in our body that makes us feel sleepy. So we wake up in the morning with very little in our system and it builds up over our days. The longer we're awake, the more we build up. By the time we're crashing out and going to bed, the signal from that adenosine way overrides the cortisol. So we start, we fall asleep, even though we haven't managed the stress to the level we'd like to but sleep breaks down adenosine. So after about three or four hours into sleep, now the signal from the adenosine is not as strong as the signal from the cortisol. So the cortisol is telling our body again, ooh, hey, stress, be alert, watch out for danger. And then we start to wake up. So we wake up two, three in the morning, we're in a stress state, we got the to-do list running through our head, or we do one of two other things generally. We either ruminate on somebody who did us wrong, and we've talked about the negativity bias, and when we are stressed, we are in a less functional state of mind. So we're more reactive, more emotional. We detect hazards where there aren't hazards necessarily in neutral situations. So we're either ruminating on somebody who did us wrong or we're catastrophizing, thinking about all the things that we didn't do that could go wrong, the things we need to prepare for, the things we need to take preparation or action against, and it keeps us awake because now our mind's spinning. And I would say too that, you know, kind of somewhere mixed into those things that, that cause us to wake up and then keep us awake is that the sensation sometimes is just of that something's wrong or just a sensation of anxiety and you don't even know what to necessarily attach it to anymore. And I know when I'm overstressed, I'll get the 2 a.m.s, I wake up, I'm staring mm -hmm. at the ceiling and I just have a sensation that something's wrong. Um, and usually anything that pops into my head, my brain will then run with and make horrible and will head right down the toilet. But the but the, that sensation of ugh is really that pure sensation of anxiety because that is what your chemistry is. That's mm -hmm. what you're carrying. And so that sensation exists because you're heightened. There, there doesn't even have to be a trigger. Exactly. Um, all the triggers came before. Now your body is 
um, you know, full of that chemical set and you just feel that way. And there's no identifiable necessarily trigger. So you can also just wake up and feel, Ugh. Right. So. And then your brain tries to attach a story to why you have that feeling. Yeah. So and there it goes. And there it yep. goes. Exactly. Yep. So I'm sure many of us have experienced that. I know I have. What can <clears throat> we do about that? For the to-do list, the best thing is actually going back to that journaling or that logging skill. Mm -hmm before you go to bed, and I do this almost religiously, is I write down everything that's on my mind. Everything I have to do tomorrow, who I have to call, what I, I need to go to, go get at the grocery store, all the things that might start spinning through my head and the wake me up. The have-tos, shouldas, and mm -hmm. mess. Exactly. That create anxiety, anxiety, anxiety. Exactly. So writing a to-do list before you go to bed is an awesome way to make it more likely you're gonna sleep through the night. If you still wake up thinking about what you gotta do, because occasionally we all get the 3 a.m., oh crap, you know, I, I forgot yep. this thing and I don't know why I remember now, but keeping a notepad by your bed so you can yep. just jot it down, let it go and go back to sleep is a really good mechanism to, to reverse that. The other two things, it goes back to nervous system activation. Like Jamie just said, the body's feeling anxiety. The body feels like there's a warning, something's wrong. And the best thing there is to talk to the nervous system. When we did a whole module on how to now downregulate your nervous system, one of the breathing techniques is that double inhale, slow, prolonged exhale. That's from Andrew Huberman's lab at Stanford. If you're a firefighter, it's also known as skip breathing. So an inhale through the nose, followed by a second inhale through the nose and a long, slow exhalation through your mouth. You can just mm -hmm. lie there. Do that for a cycle three to five. Your heart rate will come down. Your blood pressure will come down. Your nervous system will get the signal that, hey, everything's okay. That yeah. danger's not out there. It can really help you go back to sleep. Another thing too that, I, and I, I joke, um, but it's like a rhino dart to the neck, right? Just to put you completely down, or at least I think it works like that. Um, if you go on to the National Center, so nerpsc.com, and you take a look at one of our clinical tools for responders or family members, the clinical tool is about um, quieting the brain and getting rest. And um, what it does is it walks you through a more guided activity. Mm -hmm. So if your brain is running and you can't control it, the more you try to control it, the worse it is. Sometimes we need to get our brain onto something else to think about that's, but, that's stimulating enough, but dull enough to help you go down. So that exercise at the National Center, if you go log on, you'll actually be walked through an exercise and you have to wear ear pods, but you'll hear um, tones in each ear, which is kind of the magic sauce. It's replicating the bilateral stimulation of EMDR, mm -hmm. which also helps drip off some of the emotion, including anxiety, upset, anger, frustration, whatever it is, off of the memory that you're carrying and trying to process. It'll drip some of that off and you'll actually feel yourself give. You'll actually feel yourself relax. So it's a combination of the talk along with the, um, the tones in each ear which will help with some of that down regulation and hopefully put you to sleep. Awesome. It's a really cool tool. I've used so many and I can go about like 12 minutes and I'm gone, I'm back out. So I love those tools. Great. Yeah. Uh, waking exhausted. That's something else we hear from healthcare providers and responders. Oftentimes what's happening, even when you get that solid eight hours in bed, but you wake up feeling worse than when you went to sleep, is ha what's happening is that the sympathetic nervous system is still engaged at a really high level. So that cortisol level we talked about and some other factors are still so elevated, it's keeping your nervous system on alert, looking for that threat detection. So it prevents your brain, your body from dropping into that deep rest mm -hmm. state of sleep and the rapid eye movement stage of sleep. One recovers you physically, the other recovers you mentally, emotionally, yeah. processes uh, memories. When you're chronically stressed, it can be hard. You can be asleep, but you're in the light stages and you never really get to the restorative stages. So again, things you can do for that, the breathing exercises, especially the double inhale, slow exhale, physiologic side breathing, stretching, trying to get rid of that muscle tension that comes with chronic stress loads so that you're sending a signal from your body to your brain that it's okay, you can relax and go to sleep, that to-do list, mm -hmm. and then all the other things we talked about, meditation, mindfulness, and, and yeah. mindfulness, it isn't just yoga pants, candles, meditation, incense. Pillow corner with pacifiers. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. no, it's none of that. <laughs> um, it can just be paying attention to your breathing. Yeah. It can be just sitting quietly with your eyes closed, avoiding bright lights, and allowing yourself to feel what's going on in your body. It doesn't have to be 
a, it's slowing down yeah. that cognitive ADHD, really dialing in on something else. And again, I don't, sometimes for me, it's just sitting in my backyard, listening to my aspen leaves clack together, because that's a peaceful sound more than the, uh, you know, hustle of the city when we're working and all the people and humans. I like the quiet. Mm -hmm. I like the darkness of it. Those types of things to really dial in um, are, are phenomenal. It's just awesome. doing what works for you. Again, not to be um, fluffy. I think some things are super fluff and no one will ever do them. And in fact, until a couple years ago, I think, honestly, I really struggled with mindfulness stuff. I'm like, meh, go sit in a corner, find my woo saw. This doesn't feel like me. But when you realize mindfulness can be as simple as um, you know, watching the sunset or listening to the leaves or at night I read my kiddo a book and as I read him a book, I watch him. Um, and even that is super peaceful. Um, okay. So, I mean, there are so many ways that we can do it. You just have to find the one that works for you. Yeah. You're trying to decrease the stimulation in your internal and external world so that you can make that transition to sleep. There is actually a whole area of study called there sleep is. hygiene. How do you prep your sleep space? Yep. And again, this is a science. So cool room. As humans, we tend to sleep better at 64 to 68 degrees. It's better to be a little cold than a little warm. Get it chilly. Yep. yep. Um, limit light, especially if you are a healthcare worker or an emergency responder and you're used to seeing light-based alerts or you're used to auditory alerts, tones, tones radio traffic, um, alarms from a patient's room it's really important that you limit that external sensory stimuli. So room darkening blinds, if you can't do that and you don't have a basement or a dark room to sleep in, getting a sleep mask, again, not foo-foo, it actually helps because when your brain's already in a chronically stressed state and looking for alerts, mm -hmm. it will ping on any light, any sound that it picks up to raise you out of that recovery state and sleep to the lighter sleep levels to assess the threat. And the tricky part with that is it'll raise you out of the deeper states of sleep but it may not actually wake you up mm -hmm. so that you know you're waking up that many times a night. So you may think that you went to sleep and you stayed out the whole night and boy, you're just chronically fatigued, but you don't know how many times you dipped near a deep sleep and then just kept getting popped up, not awake, but right below awake. Um, and then you kind of hover here instead of getting that restful peace. You won't even know that you didn't actually wake up. Exactly. Um, and so that stinks because it's, and it's a little bit harder to diagnose because you're thinking that you'll just wake up a thousand times that's not the case. Sometimes, again, if wakefulness is here, you're going to pop up right underneath it multiple times. Some will do it as many as 200 times a night. And our eyelids are not blackout blinds. Yeah. We all know if you've been asleep and somebody comes in and flips on a light, you're aware of it even with your eyes closed. So that's why it's important to either have a super dark room or something that covers your eyes so that you don't get yeah. light triggers. Sound triggers, same thing. A white noise fan, uh, a white noise, a fan, a humidifier, anything that gets a static level of noise in the background, your brain can to drone out the outdoor noise, traffic, mm -hmm. horn, dogs barking, things like that. Yeah. Um, consistent bedtime and wait times. We talked about our circadian rhythm earlier. Our body likes consistency. It's really tough when you're a shift worker to do that. But when you're off duty and you are able to maintain consistent times, it's really important you do that as often as you can. It's better for you. Yeah. And it's harder sometimes, I think, with families when they, you need to get up and push through a day if you're going to spend time with any humans because you work nights nice graves. Um, but it, if you can get as much sleep as possible, it, it is really important and to have that start and end time um, and to prepare yourself. So sleep hygiene, um, not only strategies, but also a little bit of a, a pattern of behavior. Patterned behavior also helps your body kind of wind down. So when you, you know, draw some of the blinds and you're starting to dim the lights and you're starting to reduce the temperature in your house, that should all kind of occur at the same time. And if it's off by a couple of hours, it's still the pattern so that the body can pick up on the cue that, hey, okay, we're transitioning here. I'm getting a little bit chillier. It's getting a little bit darker. It's getting quieter. We actually start to reduce the volume on our TVs. We Nice. Um, dim the lights in our house as it gets later and we're prepping for bed. We try to kind of gradually put ourselves into that whenever we can. Nice. So it is really helpful. It's a lots of cues for the brain to start releasing um, GABA and putting the body down. So awesome. those are good signals. Well, and that's a great way to create a good sleep space for you. The practices that Jamie's talking about, again, are just as key as this, the space you're sleeping in. Unplugging from tech for a little while before you go to bed, not only because you don't want a whole lot of blue light. What blue light does is it shuts down your body's production of melatonin, which is one of the hormones yes. that induces sleep. 
We naturally start to produce it about two hours before bedtime, and that's another reason why we want as consistent a schedule as possible. But when we get bright light or blue light, it interferes with melatonin and interferes with our sleep. Um, journaling, we talked about that, downloading your brain, getting it on paper can really help ease you into sleep. Um, during the day, gratitude, time in nature, exercise, all the things we talked about that burn through the stress hormones yeah. and help trigger that parasympathetic nervous system reaction, all beneficial. One of the big things we see in responders and healthcare workers is that day to day in our jobs, we get used to so much stimulation that just like the frog slowly boiling in the pot of water that we talk about in another module, we don't recognize that our threshold for stimulation or for really caring about anything has increased at home with family that can translate into not really respecting the relevance of our, our loved one's feelings and not thinking that, you know, that doesn't qualify as an emergency, you know, nobody's dead, those sorts of comments. So that's not so great. But then the other thing is our stimulation or our threshold for stimulation can increase. And that plays out often in our forms of entertainment where video games, yeah, but we're not playing the fun animated video games. We are playing the combat video games, the really violent ones that trigger a stress response. Your heart rate's up, your hands are clenched. And your the jaws... aggression center highlights the aggression center in the brain. Exactly. And if not video games, oftentimes in movies, yeah. we watch, you know, Chicago Police, Chicago Fire, Chicago Dog Catcher, <laughs> you know, all the shows. So that triggers all of this in us. Yeah. And it also kind of triggers our worldview too. It really reinforces the, yeah. the narrow spectrum, spectrum of humanity that we see frequently in work, especially as responders is representative of the world as a whole, which can make it harder to appreciate things, to have balance and to have perspective. So avoiding overstimulating entertainment is a good idea for so many reasons. Yeah, absolutely. And I think too that um, overstimulating entertainment, whether it's gaming or the shoot 'em up movies, videos, whatever it is. I mean, I like to shoot things. I, I Not any humans, of course, but I, <laughs> I love those activities just have the right time for it. Sometimes games too, people will say, well, gaming is all bad. Gaming's not all bad. And some people utilize it to just shut out the rest of the world. And that kind of is their form of mm -hmm. meditation because they get really dialed into it and they can exclude everything else that's going on in their world. And it's their time to just be quiet and connected to this thing. And it is stimulating. So you've got that too. In eight hours, you come out of your coma and then <laughs> you realize you need to eat and use the bathroom, but it can be stimulating and it can be okay. I think um, the other part to it with avoiding stimulation is that um, it can be really anything. So remember too that news follows mm -hmm. into that. That's a huge one. People will watch the news and try to catch the weather before they go to bed. And I think that's, that's one that gets people riled up in like five seconds. Social media. Social media, like just don't. Um, do not have that be a part of your um, habit to go to bed. That can't be part of the bed habit or the cue. You don't want that to be a piece of it. So you also wanna start winding all of that stuff down about an hour before bed, shut stuff down, read a book, engage in something that's more relaxing, whatever it is. Um, I think those are plain solitaire, um, but put it on the night thing on your phone and put on your blue screen glasses and yeah. make sure that you're not overexposed, but those are good things. And one of the other things we talk about frequently through this for stress management is positive social connection. When it comes to bedmates though, if your bedmate snores a lot, um, wakes up a lot, kicks, steals the blankets, interferes with your sleep, there is such a thing called sleep divorces where you sleep in separate beds and it ultimately <laughs> leads to better rest for both and ironically a healthier relationship down the line. So if really you've done everything else and you have a hard time sleeping with your partner in the bed, it might be better for both of you to, to one sleep in a different bed or one on the sofa, one on the bed. Just something to think about. Kids too. Kid, oh, kids As too. As you're describing yeah. that, I'm thinking of my <laughs> six-year-old kicking me in the face and elbowing me, and you know. So I think I think it. I think making sure that you've got a good space to actually get some rest really is important too. Yeah. So, so great. That's it on sleep. Thank yeah. you so much for joining us for this module.